It was the morning of the third day. For a moment, we were taken aback by the distant ringing of bells. But then, clarity. We remembered what had happened and where we were. Kaiserslautern. It's a small town of about 100,000 people, with an additional 50,000 people living in the largest U.S. military community outside of the states themselves. Some locals might see it as an average place. Nothing particularly special or extraordinary. But to us, it was a charming city with beautiful architecture and vibrant people. And besides old military bases set up in the decade following World War II, there's a lot to see in here. There are old cathedrals, sunny plazas, and cozy alleyways. It was once a favorite hunting spot of a 12th century emperor, the Kaiser, because it was an island on a small river, or louder, hence Kaiserslautern. And near the city hall are ruins of one of the emperor's castles. This castle right here is the Kaiserfels, which had multiple German emperors who called it their home, especially Frederick I, the Holy Roman Emperor. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of this city? Germany seems like a very livable country. It's one of the few places I've traveled to where I was actually thinking like, oh, I could actually live here. Yeah, there's lots of squares and plazas. It's walkable, but there's enough like public transportation that you can actually get around. It's a very green city too, actually. Yeah, it's nice. Even in the city, there's still lots of plants that you can look at. This is Japanese knotweed, and it's actually, when it's uh, younger in the spring, you can eat it. And it's really invasive in the U.S., and I'm imagining it's invasive here too, but it looks quite pretty. But even today, there's more nature to explore around here, besides some invasive weeds. Like ancient castle ruins atop wooded hills. But to get there, we'd have to sit at the bus stop and wait. We hopped on the bus headed to Hohenhecken, a ward of the city, to find the ruins of the castle. It was only a short ride before we were there. We got off the bus, checked the map, and then went on our way. Dude, don't you love, like, German villages? Yeah. God, they're so good, man. So quaint. <laughs> I love how quiet it is. I love the architecture. We hiked through town, passing by the colorful array of buildings until we came to a path leading away from the streets. And so, we made our way to the castle, reflecting on our time in Germany. All of the chance encounters that had gotten us here, the circumstances that led up to today, and everything we had experienced along the way. Our journey began the same way it ended. With the kindness of strangers, an arduous experience, and the beauty of a foreign land. We had stayed a few days in Berlin, but we woke up on an early Saturday morning to leave the city. We took a train to the Berlin Central bus station, where we'd be catching a ride out of the city. After getting a few snacks, we got on the bus and waved goodbye to our friend Thea, who had shown us around the city. The bus departed, and we were soon surrounded by the sights of Germany's countryside. The vast fields, romantic towns, and greenery filled us with excitement. Before long, we'd be on our next outdoor adventure.
arrived in Kaiserslautern in late afternoon, and after settling in, met up with a couple friends. Okay, I'm going to dinner. We got. Can you pronounce his name for me? Jochen. Jochen. Okay. Max. Max. Robbie. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> We all went to grab a traditional German dinner. Look at these pansies drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> Real man drinks that. <laughs> the next morning, we got together, ironed out the details of our upcoming hike, and explored some nearby towns. The whole place, with its large cathedrals, deep history, and timber-framed buildings, felt like the setting of an old fairy tale. After exploring that, we went on a short hike through the local forests, the trails of which Johan frequently explored. <laughs> then, it was off to another town to explore the ruins of an old castle. From the ruins was a breathtaking view of the surrounding hills. And just next to it was a small eatery, where we refueled on beer and schnitzel. That evening, Max departed back to his home, and the next morning Johan had volunteered to pick us up and drive us to the start of our adventure in the Palatinate Forest. We arrived at our trailhead, which was next to a reservoir called the Eisvog. Here, there was an old train station, and some old railways. Johan, whose knowledge of the forest was invaluable, gave us some more advice before departing. And then, we were on our way. Our plan was to follow the trail along the Eisvog for a bit, then hike further into the woods until we reached a designated campsite. The next day, we travel northeast, camp at another site, before hiking out into the town of Ramsen to be picked up. The Palatinate Forest is the largest contiguous forest in Germany, and before long, we were in the thick of it. Our trail led us high up along a hill, and from this vantage point, we could peer past the trees and see the Ice Vogue Reservoir below. But deeper into the woods were old railroad tracks, overgrown with weeds and covered in moss. The old railroad. I think these are some of the red sandstone cliffs that we were told about. But they've got like a brick wall here too. Wow, this is so cool. And not far from the tracks was an abandoned shack. There's nobody living in it, is there? <laughs> could use it as an emergency <laughs> shelter if we needed. Somebody's been here. Yeah, it looks like somebody had like they have a little fire in the corner. Like somebody had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> We continued along the trail that ran adjacent to the lake, and I noticed an interesting plant. Okay, this is actually a plant that I do recognize, even though we're in a different country. Uh, this is Lily of the Valley. It's got these big broad leaves and like these dangling berries. And uh, earlier in the year, they'll have like white sort of small bell-shaped flowers and they're really pretty, but it's poisonous if you eat them, so just 
look with your eyes. <laughs> Lily of the Valley is native to Europe and Asia, and despite its toxicity, its fragrant, delicate flowers and love of shade make it a popular garden plant. The trail now led us downhill, towards a road that ran through the forest. And though a few cars passed by, it didn't distract from the scent of the conifers, which oozed with sap, or from the sight of a chrysalis delicately hanging from a shrub. We reached the bottom of the hill and crossed the road onto the next section of the trail, where Andrew noticed some more plants. Okay, so I'm not exactly sure what the species is, but this is some sort of a thistle. Uh, you can see it's got the distinctive purple flowers and all the thorns all over it. And actually, with thistles, you can usually peel the outer layer off and eat the tender shoots at the bottom. And artichokes that you find in the supermarket are actually just basically like giant thistle flowers that you can eat. So. Cool. So we've seen a lot of this plant everywhere in the woods and even in the city parks. It's got a nice hard stem that you can use for rope and the leaves actually are edible when you cook them. But of course, before they're cooked, this plant is covered in these tiny barbs that inject a chemical in you and it's really painful. It's pretty much harmless, but I mean, don't, ah, oh. Yeah, and the pain, that, that wasn't too bad, but <laughs> the pain will last there for at least several minutes. <laughs> that actually wasn't too bad. I just got like one barb in me. <laughs> Turns out I got about five barbs in me, but they don't do much more than leave temporary welts and an itchy sting on your skin. Further along, the trail once again approached the reservoir, whose shores were home to a hotel and restaurant built in the 50s. But deeper in the woods, things felt more ancient and mysterious. So in this area, we've got these really big, beautiful beech trees, which is one of my favorites. And on the ground, we've got leaf litter, but we also have just tons of old shells of beech nuts covering it. At least with the species you can find in America, the seeds inside are edible, and of course the leaves of the trees are edible during the springtime. But yeah, if you just look closely, it's just, it's almost like mulch covering the ground. And growing nearby were some fresh bolete mushrooms. This looks like uh, possibly Boletus sensibilis or a similar species. There's so many mushrooms that kind of look like this um, and you can usually tell the difference by the pore surface and by how fast it stains and the color of the stem. The stem on this is sort of whitish red and the uh, pore surface is a dark maroon almost. And then you can see that it's just staining blue so quickly. There are species that kind of look like this that are edible, like Boletus bicolor, but generally when the color changes this quickly, it's a poisonous one and you want to stay away. But of course, a lot of times the only way to tell is to cut it and splice it in half. The trail continued past the large beech trees, and we passed by some sort of old stone marker. There was a path leading to the shore of the lake, so we went ahead and explored it a bit. Swans gracefully glided across the lake's surface, and on the land, countless tiny frogs hopped about, hidden among the leaves. We continued through the woods, where the looming trees created a medieval atmosphere. The trail again ran along the lake, whose placid surface mirrored the peaceful calm of the woods. We made our way up a small hill where there was exposed pink sandstone. It was here that we would hike away from the ice vogue and explore further into the Palatinate forest. As we hiked, the deciduous trees gave way to towering pines, and the leaf litter below became overgrown with an understory of ferns and shrubs.
Here, the sky opened up and we saw our new Trailblaze number. It feels like every single part of the trail we've been on is reminiscent of like multiple places we've been in the U.S. And right now I see a cabin up there and I'm wondering if the witch is waiting to eat us. <laughs> The diversity of environments, from shaded woods to sunny, open areas, made for the growth of a variety of different plants. So whenever you're in a sunny, meadowy area like this, you find lots of interesting medicinal plants. Now this here is self-heal, which is pretty much a good medicine for general ailments. Uh, you've got plantain, both rib leaf plantain and common plantain, and that's good for like any sort of rash or bug bite or some sort of skin ailment. This is yarrow, and I've heard you can use this to keep bugs away. I'm not exactly sure how true that is. But I have heard you can also dry the leaves and crush it into a powder. And if you get some sort of a wound in the wilderness, you can put that powder inside and it'll essentially like clot the, all the blood and cauterize it. So, useful stuff. And back into the shady woods, different wildflowers bloomed. This looks like a foxglove plant. At least it's in the same genus or family probably, but foxglove is a flower people often plant in their gardens or in their yards, but it's also really poisonous. <laughs> this common foxglove, Digitalis purpurea, grows native here. But you can see why it's called that. It looks like a fox's paw would just like fit right in there. <laughs> Once again, there was a break in the shady forest canopy, and we saw signs of logging activity in the area. All of our past travels, and some physical ailments that each of us caught, had made us tired, so we decided to stop and sit for a while. You know what's nice about this is that, unlike our last international trip, the sun sets at 9.30 at night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have so much time. There's also no tremendously steep climbs. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> this whole forest has like sort of a lived-in feeling. Like, I don't know, somehow you get the feeling that there's a German village out of a fairy tale not too far away or something. <laughs> Which is probably true. <laughs> this is literally the type of place where fairy tales originated. Yeah, yeah. And you can see it in some of the trees. Like, we passed through a patch of woods that had these huge beech trees. It felt really ancient. You guys want some food? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Most family feedback. <laughs> All I've got here are granola bars and muesli. <laughs> I've got a muesli reigel. <laughs> a muesli reigel. Ein reigel. This place is heaven, man. Yeah. Wanting something a little more substantive than muesli, I broke out some of this Milkana Crowder, a sort of herbal buttery spread we found at the grocery store. After eating, I broke out my new adventure archiving journal and documented the trip so far while the others drifted to sleep. As I looked around at my surroundings, I was filled with a sense of peace. We eventually got moving again, and just off the trail we saw a strange structure, a tall wooden hunting tower. Although the forest has long been used for hunting and logging, it was only in the last century that its value as a place of recreational and ecological importance came to the forefront. The trail bent left and right, leading us to an exposed hillside with eroding pink sandstone. Among the foliage growing from the soil, I found a colorful treat. So there's some wild strawberries growing here, and normally when I see this, I would love to give it a taste test. But our friend Johan told us that in areas like this where there's lots of foxes, there's a parasite that's often transmitted to like mushrooms or berries, where it's a little worm. And if it gets in your system, it can give you really serious diseases, even like a, a, some sort of fatal disease, I think he said. You can apparently go 15 years without any symptoms of this parasite. So if you're going to eat anything in the forest, it's prudent to cook it to death. Eventually, we turned onto a two-track forest road. And the ongoing shifts in the environment continued to intrigue us. 
the way these forests look, it's like you take like the eastern forests of the U.S. and mash it together with like Yellowstone. Like all the trees just weave together. Yeah. It's really weird. Glad it's pretty flat. It's super yeah, nice. It's nice and flat. It's not too hot today. Well, it's actually really hot, but in the shade, yeah, it's perfect. really nice. In the sun, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> We came to another street crossing, and at the next trail was another strange, ancient-looking stone marker. Yeah, so on the map it says it's a boundary stone. Huh. I wonder when they put the stone here. Yeah. It's kind of old. We hiked on and we're coming up to a small detour leading to a point of interest that Johan had told us about. So I think this is the offshoot of the trail that goes to that old railroad that we saw at the beginning. But there's a tunnel that some runs along here somewhere. But again, we rested. I was just recovering from some sort of sickness that Brian had just contracted. And Andrew had occasional waves of stomach cramps. The heat of the sun didn't make us feel any better, but eventually we continued on. I think we can see the train tracks just down there and the turn's just up ahead. So we'll double back over here and then follow the train tracks to the tunnel. Shooting off of the two track road was a dirt path speckled with patches of tall grass. Although the forest felt really peaceful, we decided to avoid any further ailments by preparing ourselves for ticks. With our socks rolled over our pants and plenty of deep bug spray on us, we hiked through the grass. It wasn't long before we saw signs of an old railroad. Yeah, I think this looks like a good entry point. Just have to be careful getting down. But the trail had taken us a bit too far, and the railroad we wanted to walk along was far below us, surrounded on either side by sheer brick walls. So we backtracked and found our way to the tracks. Soon, we could feel an unnatural, frigid draft coming towards us. You could kind of feel like cold air coming out for a second. <laughs> you can kind of smell that musty smell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like coming out of the tunnel. I wonder how many years it's been abandoned. I don't know. And how many years does it take for something like this to be overrun? Or like completely overgrown? Yeah, there's like moss growing on the actual tracks. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, do you smell that? It smells like a mall or something. It smells like, like a mall. museum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, it is musty. Scary, Whoa. man. It's just wow. like a pure, dark void. It's like it feels like if you go in there, you'll just never come out. <laughs> Tracks like these once carried passengers from villages through the forest, but these ones, built in 1932, had been abandoned since the late 80s. Although the forest had been warm and welcoming, the dark void residing within this abandoned tunnel filled us with an ominous, unsettling sensation. Well, we could store our beer here. <laughs> That is the other end of the tunnel, right? That yeah. light? Whoa, look at that scary door. Yeah. Enter the scary door. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is how dark it actually is right now on camera. We're gonna brighten it up a little bit just so you can see inside. It says SIGS. It's like the name of their boy band or something. That's definitely the other end of the tunnel. You hear bugs and stuff. That is just wicked. <laughs> okay. Wow, dude. Keep going or? 
I feel like we can go in a little bit more at least. <laughs> 12 26 2015. I mean, ironically, if you think about it, the day after Christmas, two years ago. Stuff in the grass is probably more dangerous than whatever's in here. Most likely. As long as nobody's living here. Like, I wouldn't be able to handle if somebody lives here. <laughs> what oh, do you hear that? Man, the scariest things in life are human made. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, dude, now that I think about it, I bet there's people on YouTube who have explored this whole tunnel. You can always check their videos. <laughs> Adventure Archives is known for many things, but bravery is definitely not one of them. <laughs> And then, it was back into the light. We couldn't help but be filled with a sense of relief as we found our way back onto the trail. And further up, we saw another strange landmark, though one a bit less ominous. This might be the like memorial for the court or something. Oh, the judicial thing. That's what Johan was talking about? Yeah, yeah. This monument represents a medieval court that once stood here. The nine smaller stones on the outside represent the chairs of nine villages that shared the forest. Next to the monument was a picnic table, so it was time for lunch. I want some brat. We're gonna try this herring and some sort of cream sauce. <laughs> it doesn't get more European than that. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, we know. Guten Appetit. <laughs> it's good. It's like a mustard juice sauce. Mm. This is Wiesbauer. I don't know what it is, but it's sausage and we've got a little German kid in Lederhosen. <laughs> Clearly that must mean it's authentic. <laughs> that actually is very good though. Das ist gut. <laughs> After lunch, Brian went ahead to see if he could scout out our campsite. He'd give us two whoops for success and three for failure. We just got the whoop from Brian. That is a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Is that an outhouse? Yeah, we got an outhouse. Sweet. I'm not 100% sure on water though. Um, but we'll figure that out. I'll let you guys go check it out yourself. The campsite had plenty of amenities, including a huge communal fire pit. Oh my goodness, dude. Dude, this is like a Game of Thrones campsite or something. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. This is nice. It's gonna be a good night. They've even got like tables made and like somebody's made like a chair over there. Yo, this is fantastic, man. Now it was time to sit down and settle in. So you said that yesterday this place was full. Yeah, because I couldn't get a reservation. Today it's empty. Yeah. <laughs> they must have just had a bunch of people here like cutting wood or something. Like these, some of these benches look really fresh. We've got our outhouse there. Very much similar to a campsite in the US, but just more grand. We weren't used to such spacious and luxurious campsites, but backpacking in Germany is pretty much unheard of. And in most places, the style of camping we're used to is completely prohibited. Even this campground, like we're hiking from one campground to another campground, but typically I think these campgrounds are designed for just people to come in and day hike and then leave the next day or something. That sign says that this is the largest contiguous forest in Germany. Really? I am like, I am beat. Yeah, me too. I think it's all the sunlight or something. 
I guess I didn't get much sleep either. <laughs> Why don't we set up our tents <laughs> and get in them? <laughs> Guten Tag, ich bin ein Tent. <laughs> While the others settled into their tents, I put up my tarp. The summer midday heat was intense, and I wanted to lie out in the open. We all dozed off in the late afternoon sun. Hours passed, and we awoke once again in the evening. In Germany, they have a thing called Studentenfutter. I believe that's not how you pronounce it, but it means student fodder. And this is from our buddy Max. He gave us another present, which we'll open up later. But thank you, Max, for the student fodder. And student fodder is nothing more, nothing more. <laughs> and trail mix. You can just eat it like that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Mm, it's good. It's unsalted. It was unsalted student fodder. <laughs> Raw almonds are so much better. All of those crunchy students made us thirsty, so Robbie and I left to fill up water at a spring about half a mile away. Yeah, I can hear the bubbling water. I think we can assume that this is from the lake, and also that this is no drinking without filtering. Yeah. So, sure. The water from the spring was clear, but it had a sign saying that it was not meant for drinking. As we understood it, this was more just for legal reasons than anything else, and it was perfectly fine to drink after filtering. After filling up, we made our way back to camp. With a safe amount of water for the night, I think it's time to drink our other gift from Max. A Munich Hell. Did he explain what that means? It's a type of beer, that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but this Munchen right here, or Munchner, that uh, I think means from Munich. It's not gonna be cold, unfortunately. Let's see if this works. Haha, <laughs> nice work. You can do the honors. <clears throat> Some good hell. <laughs> Ooh, that is good. Yeah. Yeah, even room temperature. Yeah. <sighs> That's actually really good. <laughs> Goes really well with the student fodder. <laughs> 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 That's good stuff. <laughs> it's so weird how different and similar this is at the same time. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the main thing is is that the actual environment and the hiking and camping is similar, but like the culture around it is very different. I was actually thinking the other day, like the environment is really similar just at a quick glance, but there's so many subtle things that make it feel different. Mm. It's really weird. Like, even I don't know anything about botany, but you can tell the trees are yeah. <clears throat> different here. Like, all of those Yosemite-looking trees. Yeah, yeah. Well, German beer almost has a chocolatey taste. Like, every beer I've had here <clears throat> starts to have... Oh, maybe... I was thinking of the coffee. Never mind. <laughs> Some of the coffee has that taste, too. <clears throat> Hope my stomach doesn't riot tonight. <laughs> It's amazing how good it is right now. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> maybe we're just really thirsty too. <laughs> Probably a bad idea to drink beer. <laughs> thirsty. That's good. It was soon nighttime, and the fireflies danced about as we drifted off to sleep. Thank you.
had been a cool night, but the rising sun quickly warmed the earth. The heat, along with each of our ailments, made us pretty tired in the morning. We eventually got our things packed up and broke camp, but still fell out of it. Did you guys sleep enough, at least? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when we got to the campsite, I pretty much just crawled into my tent and laid there the whole day. <laughs> it doesn't feel like I got enough sleep, but I'm pretty sure I did. How late were you guys up? Maybe I didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> what was it like the first time we went to Hocking Hills and you were sick? <laughs> was it better or worse than what it's like right now? Well, right now, like I have, it's like a persistent annoyance. When I was at Hawking Hills, I was just basically had no energy. Wait, you had a stomach thing then too, right? Yeah. I wonder if that's why I feel like I don't have energy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that and the heat, between that and the heat, I think, just makes me want to lie down for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we technically don't have far to hike. How do you feel, Rob? I feel <clears throat> I felt better yesterday, actually. Compared no, to today? I? No, maybe I feel better today. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, this is a beautiful forest. Yeah, it's like, in spite of all that, it was a very peaceful evening last night. <laughs> we reviewed the map, as the forest was filled with an at times confusing network of trails. We hiked out and came to a section of the woods where the trail and the canopy opened up. The heat of the sun only got hotter as the day went on, but soon the trail led us back into the shady forest. We hiked by some more guide stones, which accentuated the forest's unique and mystical qualities. Regardless of how many forests we go to, it always surprises me how different each one can be. It's and all like the old ruins we run into, yeah. it's like you can feel the history in the forest. It really does feel like we're in a Brothers Grimm tale. <laughs> Yet, in spite of its uniqueness, the forest also felt somehow deeply familiar after just one day of being here. We continued on through the open woods and stumbled across a pile of feathers. Whoa. What do you think? Pigeon? It almost looks like the colors of the crows we've been seeing. Looks like something got eaten. <laughs> this looks like it was just like plucked out, you know? Yeah. And further into the woods, we found another hunting tower and decided to take a closer look. There was a window on the other side of the structure to look at. The whole thing is really rickety. Yeah else down there. Yeah, I saw that. I'm not too sure what this is exactly. Maybe a place to like dress your deer or something. 
So there's a mountain marked on the map. I think we're pretty much already on the mountain. It looks more like a tiny hill, but there's all this blue sky everywhere. It looks like there's just nothing. Well, there's like, I think maybe the keystone or whatever you call the stone they put up at the top of the mountain. I have to say, this is one of the easier mountains that I've summited. <laughs> Although it was a tiny hill, the point marked by the stone apparently had an elevation of 353 meters. We continued on through a quiet part of the forest, where pine trees towered high and foxglove flowers bloomed. It's like somebody who had one too many wiener schnitzels trying to climb that ladder. <laughs> Eventually, we reached a large junction of trails and roads. Here, there was a bulletin board with information about the surrounding area. Got a geocache right here. We decided to rest and have some lunch, which would include goulash, fresh from the can. Tastes just like stew. Which, considering that's what it is, it's a good thing. <laughs> this is about the least German flavor you could get. Salsa picante. <laughs> Looks good though. Oops. It's like fish taco flavored or something. <laughs> After that, Robbie suggested that we diverge from our trail and head west instead of east to explore a small pond and picnic area that was marked on the map. We were hoping that the pond would be a nice place to swim and cool off from the hot summer sun maybe help us feel a little less sick. We continued through the peaceful woods and came to a junction pointing to the direction of restaurants and towns. Soon, we entered a section of the forest that was a nature preserve. Here, some birch trees grew in the distance and we neared the pond. I don't know if it's swimmable or not, but there is some water down there. And at least there's a picnic table so we can sit down. Okay, we do not want to swim in that, but we can rest here. That at least makes it worthwhile. Oh, oh yeah. We were pretty exhausted. Robbie decided to scout ahead and see if the pond was swimmable anywhere, but Brian's sickness just seemed to be getting worse. I think the worst thing about what I have right now is that Everything's stuffy, so every time I cough, I can't tell if I've got, like, dehydration or if it's just a sickness. <laughs> we continued resting, waiting to hear back from Robbie. Okay, Robbie said he'd whoop three times if the lake wasn't swimmable and two if it was. Okay, I don't know if you heard that, but <clears throat> he just whooped three times, which means we came here for nothing. <laughs> At least I can just keep sitting here. What do you have to say for it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've led us astray. <laughs> <laughs> like I w walked next to the water and I could feel the heat emanating off of it. <laughs> this is not a little mountain stream. This is a cesspool that's been baking in the sun for a few days. Under normal circumstances, if we had felt like this, we would have just postponed the trip. But since we're in Germany, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> can't really do that. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Because if you don't do the trip, you haven't wasted it, but you feel like you haven't gotten the most out of it. Yeah, yeah. But then if you do do the trip, you feel like, well, I didn't even feel good, so what was the point of doing <laughs> How bad are you feeling right now? Well, I'm not feeling great. Brian, you can very easily tell, is not doing great. <laughs> My pains come and go, it's like... When there's no cramps, I feel great, and then as soon as they hit, I just like... I'm at a 6.7, 6.8. Uh, I'm probably at a 7. <laughs> that's a C minus, that's not a good score, just in case. I'm in the D range. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like people have different 1 to 10 scales. <laughs> On a scale of 1 to 10, I feel like <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, let's think about this seriously. Though. Should we go to a bed and breakfast instead? <laughs> We're not far. Yeah. Which one's the bed and breakfast? That, that restaurant? Mm -hmm. Due to my condition, we were debating uh, if we wanted to walk about a kilometer and a half further down, see if there are uh, 
bed and breakfast was an, an option. The only problem with that is it would significantly change our plans tomorrow and where we would get picked up. So in the end, we decided that we would just beeline it to the campsite and get up kind of early tomorrow and take advantage of that cold weather. We also only have 100 euros and we don't even know how much it costs. Yeah. Don't even know if it's open or anything, so we'll just go straight to Ramsden tomorrow morning and uh, sit at a nice cafe for the entire day. <laughs> <laughs> My watch is registering 93 degrees, just the ambient air. Wow. This is like scorching. Eventually, we made it back to the large trail junction, got our bearings, and figured out which path we had to take, and continued on towards the town of Ramson. Along the way, we found a small hut, which had a sign on it about preventing forest fires. Maybe it's just a hut to get out of the rain. Huh. It's raining. Huh. And then, a little up the path, we found even stranger artifacts. There's something weird over here off the path. Not sure what it is. That is more than a little weird. Like they've got these notches here and then the worms burrowed into this part of the tree. And then inside there's like a candle or something. Maybe it's a mosquito candle or something. Maybe it's a pagan sacrificing pole. <laughs> I'm glad we're not here at night. Nearby there was another hunting tower. Maybe this was just a campsite and not a sacrificial site. Along the trail, we saw signs of logging and timber harvesting. But humans weren't the only industrious creatures in the woods. I saw some of these earlier, but it's a, that big mound is a wood ant's nest. It's basically like a bunch of pine needles all clumped up and inside is the ant's lair. And uh, I think we haven't seen one of these since like our very first episode at Dolly Sods. If you were in a survival situation, you could put a tarp out, fold the edges over so that there's like sort of a shady area, and just start scooping this onto the tarp, like dumping the whole thing. And what'll happen is all the ants will carry their maggots into the dark areas to hide them. And once they're done doing that, you can just collect all the maggots and eat them. Although they might be a tasty survival snack, these ants can spray foul-smelling formic acid to deter threatening predators. Further up was a heavily logged area, with stacks of timber on either side of the trail. We were supposed to be near our campsite, but we didn't see any signs of it anywhere. Our campsite is supposed to be just up ahead on the right, but all I'm seeing are a bunch of logs. So either we got the place wrong or it's further up ahead than I realized. This right here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, that little it? junction right there? We stopped before we hiked too far to no, check the map and scout around. No, I think... We decided to split up and explore the different trails leading in opposite directions to see if anyone could find anything. The good news is that down there there's civilization in the road, so we're where we think we should be, but there's no sign or map that shows where the camping place is. So Brian just went that way to see if there's an entrance to the campsite from the other side. But I actually think we saw a trail shooting off to the right from where we came from that sort of like went to a hunter's tower, but I think that actually might lead to the campsite. And then, it was my turn to split off and scout around for the campsite. The paths I was trying to see didn't really lead anywhere. The only thing I can think, wherever there's like a two-track road where the equipment has been driving and stuff, they spray paint the trees with two lines. So maybe we just take one of those and use the GPS to find our way to the campsite. You didn't see anything? Went to that building and it was just like a, hmm. a water drainage thing or something. And it was locked, you couldn't even go in. Robbie again went to scout out a trail. If he found anything promising, he'd give two whoops to let us know, and three if there was nothing. And he just gave the two whoop signal, 
which means that he found it. The campsite's right there. We just can't get to it from this side because there's a really steep hill. I saw like a red sign at the campsite that said like no fire. Wait, so back up that way? Oh, it's a really steep hill? Well, I mean, if we go on this side, we'd be climbing like... You know, maybe that's what I, why I missed. I had seen the campsite from the opposite yeah, side of its entrance, but I still didn't explain why we didn't see any path leading to it originally. Now that we knew the campsite existed, we decided to head back on our original path and search for a way to get to it. I think this path will take us to the campsite. At least, if these GPS coordinates are right, and what my own eyeballs saw from the other side, I think this should be good. I can see it right there. There's stuff over there. I'm sure that's the campsite. But this doesn't look like the entrance. I'm sure you're not supposed to enter from here. Let's see if we can reverse engineer the entrance by just finding it. Why is it here? Where is the entrance? Is this the entrance? My suspicion that we would just have to take one of these logging roads that are marked with two spray paint lines was correct. You would have never known that if you were just hiking on your own. Okay, well, first problem solved. We found the campsite. How on earth were we supposed to get in here? Whoop, whoop! Yes, I was just down there. I saw this red sign over here. Weird. Is this the entrance? You know, I guess it's possible that these logging people, they didn't know about the campsite. So they put up all these logs and just blocked the entrance. That definitely seems to be the case. This so, would have all been much more easy to deal with if nobody was sick. <laughs> oh my God, if, if I wasn't sick, I'd, all I would be is tired, that's it. Yeah. Well, the other problem is that we're down to a little over a liter of water for the three of us. So we're gonna have to find a place to fill up at some point or a beer store to get beer from. <laughs> well, luckily the city's just right down there. Yeah. So just going there. Today has been a scorcher. Yeah. Like just the ambient air feels so hot. Was the entrance not even marked? No. If it was, it was blocked by all those logs, so. I expected something like the last one we were at with like, like 10 campsites. And... This looks like one that literally you just have to put a GPS coordinate in and the fun part is finding where it's at. <laughs> I was actually really close to here when you started whooping. <laughs> I was oh, like, really? I was like right over there. <laughs> so the town is literally 20 minutes of a walk that way. And what are our options? <laughs> well, all three of us have some sort of discomfort. We are very short on water. We can't even have a fire mm -hmm. here. This is a pretty disappointing campsite. <laughs> like what is going on? And I think it's more of an adventure to go into town and do this. Yeah, like right? we didn't fly across the world to Germany <laughs> just to stay at this campsite. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. We're going into town, that's what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> Put on your later hosen. <laughs> it was time to take things into our own hands. We left the campsite and hiked out of the woods, determined to get to the town of Ramsen. And so, our time in the Palatinate Forest ended. We hiked off into the open meadows and made our way towards Ramsen.
We arrived in the town of Ramson, where we hoped to find some food in a hotel room to rest and recuperate. That's the hotel. Hopefully they speak English, and hopefully they have vacancies. <laughs> I will take one of those two. <laughs> Preferably the vacancies. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> so the hotel didn't have any vacancies, unfortunately. But hopefully this other place still has something to eat. Hopefully Johan can come pick us up. If not, we can always go to the campsite. I don't know if Brian can. The, the restaurant's right there. Let's go there. Let's get some food, and then we can decide. We stopped at a pizza place, which according to Google, was run entirely by one guy named Mario, and got some beer, currant juice, and pizzas. Despite the circumstances, it's moments like these that really make the memories and make the trip. You know, you get to sit around with your friends, family, and just enjoy this. So, things didn't go quite according to plan. But as we looked around and felt the evening air, we decided things were just fine. Before long, Johan arrived and picked us up and took us back to Kaiserslautern. We relaxed as we sat in the car, watching as evening set in. We drove off into the setting sun. Our journey ended the same way it began, with the kindness of friends, an unforgettable experience, and the beauty of a home away from home. We had come to Germany after a chance encounter with a stranger at a hostel in Japan. That stranger quickly became a close friend. Everybody we had met during our time here showered us with a kindness, usually reserved for friends and family. Thea graciously showed us around Berlin. Matthias shared currywurst with us over conversation late into the night. Max, with his crate of beer, joined us on hikes around the town. And Johan, with his intimate knowledge of the forest, helped us plan our trip and brought us back to safety when things turned sour. Now, Brian was back in town getting some much needed rest. Although we started our trip dealing with a whole host of physical ailments, when we looked back on our time in the forest, we only felt fondness. That's the way life goes. When you spend a long enough time in a different place and make an effort to get to know people, you start to understand them. Sometimes times get tough and things don't go according to plan. Whether it's something small like a camping trip gone awry or something larger, it's in these moments that we're presented with a choice. Do we push away the unfamiliar? cast our blame on people who are different from us and focus on ourselves? Or do we get to know one another, to learn about our differences and find solidarity with each other? We were glad that we chose to learn more about Germany. And after a week here in this foreign land, we started to feel much more like we were locals, right at home. Es ist so schade, Brian kann nicht hier sein. Ja, und Thomas. Johan is off of work, and we're gonna go eat dinner right now. It's about seven o'clock. This is so-called Stolperstein. Stumping stone. This is part of the world's largest distributed monument. These stones are mounted uh, on the pavement uh, in front of houses where people lived that got um, somehow harmed by the Nazi regime. Mm. Ah. So this is the last home they voluntarily choose to stay, and this is there to remind.
today is Andrew's birthday, and since Brian and Andrew are both robots, they didn't say anything <laughs> about it or celebrate it at all. So, happy birthday, Andrew. Right, this is enough. Thank you. Thank you. This is enough of a celebration. <laughs> characteristic masts uh, the, the, the masts that stay upright mm -hmm. that there are several lights in a row on mm -hmm. top of each other oh, yeah, yeah. the sandstone cliffs that are so typical for this area but this is only a very 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 tiny one yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yo, we've been on the road for literally 14 hours, two in the morning right now. Finally taking a 20 minute break at a gas station. It was the longest traffic jam I've ever experienced in my life. This is probably the worst experience I've ever had in my life. The bus is 800 degrees. Death would be preferable right now. The plus side, <coughs> Andrew got this sweet hot dog. <laughs> I almost don't think it's real that we're actually off the bus right now. What a nightmare, dude. Nightmare. Probably the sunrise. What is that? That's the rift into hell mm. that opened. <laughs> like, I don't even understand what's happening right now. It's two in the morning and the sky looks like it's evening. What? It certainly has started, started out ominously with the flat tire. <laughs> This trip has been a rocky road. Ice cream. Been a to true, say the least. true test of our resolve. Last day in Berlin. A very good trip, but a surprisingly unsmooth trip. It's going to be good to be back home. Thanks so much to all our patrons. We've got a list here because we have terrible memory. So first off, thanks to Sinjian Huang and his uh, two kids, August and Everett Huang. Shout out to John and Lisa Truitt. Thank you for hosting us during the solar eclipse. Shout out to Keith Trice. And a shout out to Jacob Milliken. Shout out to Trails We Hike. Keep on making those YouTube videos. And also myhikes.org. Uh, shout out to Expedition Research, LLC. Uh, shout out to Bruce Phillips, who would like to give a shout out to Elise, Elliot, and Graham. And also, shout out to Eric Osley and Paul Chandler. Is he the Gators? I think so, yeah. Yeah, Paul Chandler. <laughs> Go Gators! Yeah, Gators. <laughs> shout out to Charlie Joe, thank you very much. And Hong Long. Uh, Greg Cribb. Uh, and T. Bryce Ryan. We've said it before and we'll say it again. Keep on sharing and caring. And finally, Jim Potts. You're the crock pot of this operation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
is. I thought, I thought we were meeting in Austria. It was Austria, right?